Okay, here, here we are. We both, oh, you have your natural systems agriculture hat. Oh. Okay. So, so here we are. We had a very exciting morning. Uh, it rained, um, but we right. got the tour done. So um, uh, everybody say hello to Andreas. Okay, there we go. Okay, wonderful. Hello, good, good afternoon. So I'll just make a quick introduction and then I'll let you introduce yourself a bit more. So Andreas right. Right. is a professor at the University of uh, Eustace Libet University in Gießen and he specializes in organic agriculture. I first met Andreas when he was working at Fiebel in Basel, Switzerland, and I've admired his work and we've met a couple of times and I'm thrilled that he's uh, agreed to share his knowledge with us. So Andreas, we will let you share your screen and we'll listen to you. Great, great. Before I share the screen, I also have a, a visitor, guest scientist from overseas. Here is uh, Professor Hernan Payan from University of Talca, Chile. Um, he is also a professor for organic farming. So he just uh, came by to um, to attend or join, um, enjoy the, the lecture here. And now I start sharing the screen. Good afternoon again from uh, the research farm Gladwarer Hof, uh, Germany, which belongs to the University of Gießen. So I'm I'm sitting uh, a few hundred yards away from this nice uh, black white colored cows, and I'd like to talk about eco-functional intensification and circularity through organic soil crop livestock systems. Where are we? Um, you see the map of Germany, you see Frankfurt um, relatively in the middle, and uh, 50 kilometers north is Gießen. It's uh, a town with um, 80,000 inhabitants, and in the west, in red, there is the research farm, Gladbrauhof, the organic research farm, which uh, belongs to the university. But um, I'd like to talk why um, we should go for organic farming or how you call it natural systems um, agriculture. Although we had uh, high productivity gains, um, especially in German agriculture for wheat, for potatoes, for milk, you see the um, yield increases from 1950 until um, 2090 or um, 1980 above in in green and so uh, yes the the agricultural um, achievements were quite huge in in terms of feeding people but at the expenses at high external costs and for germany it has been calculated and this is a uh, the report from the government, um, uh, a Zukunftskommission Landwirtschaft, which uh, somehow calculated 21 billion of um, of um, of um, turnover from German agriculture, but the external effects, environmental costs, um, go up to 90 billion. If this value is really true at the end, uh, it's disputable, but it shows that it really causes quite some uh, environmental impacts. And um, that's why uh, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, especially in Europe, and but also elsewhere, pioneers started to come with other type of agriculture. And nowadays you can really say that organic farming um, is a role model to make agriculture greener. And also it is an incentive for the conventional agriculture to um, make um, the overall conventional agriculture more sustainable, as has been shown by this publication by Rank Ion and others. And coming to Justus Liebig University, Justus Liebig was not just the uh, founder of the mineral 
plant nutrition theory, but he also worked on uh, closing uh, nutrient cycles on uh, the fertility of the field. And he um, has been cited by a famous uh, agronomist, um, a professor from Boguslavsky, uh, that not the fertility of the field, but the permanence of the field is in the hands of man. Uh, so um, this is uh, where we are, Justus Liebig University. And um, here I'd like to um, tackle these four topics uh, telling about the success story organic farming, that standard organic farming is not enough, and uh, what might be the benefits from eco-functional intensification. And when we uh, talk about success in organic agriculture, we have to also um, name our research from Gladbacher Hof as a success story. And you see down left, um, um, the far left uh, guy below is Andreas schmidt Isaac, who was the administrator here for um, nearly 30 years. And since two years, his uh, son, Johannes Isaac, follows. He, he is the new um, agricultural administrator from Gladbacher Hof. And um, the farm is uh, located in the in the west of the province of um, Hessen and runs um, organic dairy. It runs uh, organic cereal production and um, also some uh, chicken for eggs. And last year we had a big event. It's somehow similar what you do today, but last year there were uh, up to 12,000 guests on our premises, and it even attracted um, conventional farmers to look about innovations to get rid of um, chemical uh, additives or other kind of agrochemicals and to, to work more um, in uh, uh, with nature. So this was really excess. And, and when we look at the global figures, now we have um, 76.4 million hectares under organic farming, and half of it uh, derives from Oceania, uh, Australia with um, nearly uh, 36 million hectares, which is mostly rangeland, I would say. And um, Europe with uh, nearly 18 million hectares is the second largest, largest, largest area with organic agriculture. But Globally, in percent, organic farming is still a leash. You see it in the title, it's 1.6% uh, of total farm land, which is organic. But what does it mean uh, percentage-wise? Uh, for Europe, um, it is Austria on the far left with more than 25% million, uh, 25%, uh, of organic farmland followed by Estonia and so on. And Germany has around 10% organic agriculture in terms of acreage. And the ambition for the EU is to come up with 25% in average of organic farm uh, farming by 2030, which is quite challenging, I would say. Also, Europe is a big market for organic retail sales. Uh, you see in total, it's um, 54.5 billion euros uh, for 2021 and Germany nearly 16 billion, which is um, uh, the largest market for organic uh, turnovers. How does organic farming in Germany develop uh, for um, for the uh, total farmland, it started with nearly 1 million hectare in 2010, and now in 2020, it's um, nearly 1.9 million hectares, um, around 10% of the total agricultural acreage. And this corresponds to uh, nearly 37,000 um, farms um, which have the organic label. And in Germany, we have an even more 
ambitious target for organic farming. And, and this means um, 30% organic farming by 2030. And um, it, uh, a, a wonder needs to <clears throat> happen to reach this um, target because um, the latest um, um, increases show rather a linear uh, increase um, of 17% um, of organic farming by 2030 in Germany. So um, yes, it's quite ambitious, but things are moving. And one uh, target is to um, that the big retailers increase the demand of uh, food via retailing. So um, actually nowadays, uh, the big retailers, Edeka, Aldi, Rewe, um, um, Lidl, uh, have a, high, a far higher market share of organic produce than the traditional whole food shops. Uh, which started with organic produce originally. And um, to increase the demand um, for out-of-home catering, because um, in average 17 million people eat daily in public uh, kitchen, schools, kitas, hospitals, and others. So um, it is uh, quite a good target to provide them with healthy food, from regional organic farming. So actually, <clears throat> um, a legislation has been brought by the uh, German government uh, a couple of months ago to um, go for a campaign and to uh, start with the public uh, kitchens which belong to the governmental offices. Standard organic farming is not enough. We have to do more than uh, the organic agriculture had always had, had how it has been conducted the last 30 years. And um, me and, and my group and others have produced quite a lot of um, evidence to show what um, organic farming means for soil, for um, productivity for, for the climate impact and so on. And here an example from a former PhD student, Martina Lori, who works actually at Feeble Switzerland. Uh, she showed in her master, uh, in her, um, in one of her PhD papers that um, under organic farming, we have enhanced microbial biomasses. Um, and this is true for microbial biomass, carbon, nitrogen, and total phospholipid fatty acids. All these have higher values than the conventional um, pairs, um, counterparts. And for um, nitrogen transformation activities, protease, urease, um, the same. So enhanced values and um, and it's not just that, but also uh, enhanced carbon stocks under organic farming, less area scaled and equal or lower yield scaled greenhouse gas emissions, higher above ground diversity, equal animal welfare. And um, under, under animal welfare, uh, we understand health, behavior and emotions. So not just the health issue, uh, equal food quality and um, and at the same time, lower abundance of unwanted residues. This has been uh, nicely shown by a meta study of um, Yajin Baranski. But, and this is a big, big topic still, it is even more since the Ukraine crisis that organic farming faces lower yield yields or much lower yields. Globally, it means um, the yield gap is some somewhere around 20%, 9 to 25, according to these uh, references. And in Germany, it's even more pronounced because um, German agriculture, German conventional agriculture actually is quite intensive. So um, for cereal crops, it's even most um, pronounced and in average is around 20 to 43%. And, and so um, we talk about 
organic farming in the long shadow of less yield. And um, a few years ago, uh, a paper by Tim Zerchinger and others came out to assess the efficiency of changes in land use for mitigating climate change. So um, there are a lot of theories behind what um, might be the negative impacts when you don't produce enough. But uh, these things are dispu disputable. But um, for completeness reasons, I want to show the full picture, which kind of discussions are going on. With long-term organic farming, you really create uh, another soil. And this is also, I think, what you have been, uh, what, what uh, can be demonstrated on the, on the Clean Lea uh, research station uh, near, um, uh, near union, your university, and even more uh, pronounced in this very long-term ongoing um, doc trial in Switzerland near Basel since 1977. Conventional is managed to a, a, a certain uh, guidelines and organic. And here I uh, picked um, the biodynamic uh, treatment and you see on the right more structures, more um, more species, not just the, the crop species. So it's winter wheat, I guess. And on the left also, the soil has some uh, kind of um, um, uh, uh, silty um, particles which uh, close the, the pores. And uh, when it comes to a heavy rain event, these, is, these features on the right are really needed. And um, here, example of a water retention of um, these two soils after heavy rain, um, we call uh, 20 millimeters an hour a heavy rain um, in Switzerland. And the, the same soil on the left showed some water locking uh, features, whereas the uh, biodynamic soil uh, could take up uh, the water amount quite um, sufficiently. But when it comes to extreme rain, like we get it nowadays even more and more, here at Gladbacher Hof, the, the biggest rain event in the uh, last, uh, in recent years was in 2018, where we got more than 100 millimeters um, per hour. Although we manage organically since uh, 35 years, so the valuable um, organic soil was really moved away, washed away, and you can see the implications. That means for some of the climate change um, impact, we are not good enough. So um, that's why I come to the next uh, chapter and um, want to show some examples um, how we can get more resilience. And um, <clears throat> one important thing is make targeted use of natural processes and ecosystem services for improved resilience. And, and agroforestry is one prime example for it. And here, this uh, recent publication by Etzo Feldkamp and colleagues, University of Göttingen, came out from their uh, field trials with uh, and also other uh, data evaluation with um, some <clears throat> positive <clears throat> attributes uh, of cropland agroforestry as um, compared with open cropland or grassland agroforestry as compared with open grassland. And um, important uh, is for, uh, for such rain events, I showed uh, just before, uh, what about the erosion resistance? And you see it's a really strong um, feature, which is... Uh, really addressed by cropland agroforestry. And that's why we also um, started here in my group, and you see uh, above the three persons working on it, Philip Weckenbrock, Eva Maria Minas, and Wiebke Nita at our research farm and um, implemented three agroforestry systems um, with different aims. Huh? So um, we, 
we live in a hilly uh, area, so erosion reduction is um, for silver arable um, important issue, but at the same time creating wood woody products, uh, not just um, a grassland strip, but also um, using trees for producing something. Yeah? Um, and um, and the, the second one is uh, silver pastoral to provide shadow for the for the livestock. And the, the, th the third one is also uh, a silver arable system, um, which is actually aligned in a contour farming manner, as you can see. Hopla. <clears throat> And uh, yeah, these are the the three agroforestry systems we have installed in the in the last years, and now started to do research. And um, what you really get is a lot of public at, um, awareness for it. And people uh, pass by um, when they uh, come along with the car uh, because there is a, a public road and uh, are interested to see what's going on. So we are conducting quite a lot of um, of farm tours uh, around the agroforestry system. But what's also needed is massive development for agroforestry uh, monitoring. And this is... <clears throat> This is ex extremely important if you do long-term soil monitoring um, and you want to always go back to the same uh, site and also to somehow um, include or exclude the, the influence of the, of the tree strips. So um, uh, we have recently submitted um, a, a manuscript to a geoderma regional to come up with um, a review and the standardized standardized soil sampling design for agroforestry systems and the setup of the tree lines is uh, is different. Uh, we have uh, also pure lines with just apple or with only poplar or with only uh, timber trees, but also have um, in uh, lines with combination of fruit trees of biomass trees and timber trees and this uh, really should change over time when um, the trees or the system becomes more mature. And also from this uh, project, we could publish uh, quite a few papers and also guidelines how to do uh, soil analysis, uh, soil sampling strategies, as you can see the leaflet on the right site. And um, here are a few examples of, of the of the sites. Um, and um, this is the youngest site, GH3. But um, also um, there are even um, there are far more strategies available for improved resilience. And one is um, uh, is mulch vegetable production. Um, I just need to sorry. Ah, what's that? Hmm. I leave it as it is. It's my my mouse part is a bit sticky. I'm just going through. Don't using the mouse pad again. <clears throat> yeah, um, then we have uh, another strategy, which me, um, is how to make um, vegetable farming more climate friendly and more resilient. And um, and you see on the on the right figure below, on the right um, photograph below, how celery is growing in a ten centimeter thick layer of uh, mulch biomass, 
and is uh, directly transplanted with the a device you see just on top of it. And um, and the mulch is normally growing on the same side. And when it is not enough, we also use uh, uh, mulch from uh, from a so-called transfer or, or giving field. So in, in total, you have to have um, a 15 tons um, of dry matter of uh, biomass per hectare. So a thick layer which suppresses weed which conserves the water, which cools the salt, and creates a nice um, uh, habitat for yes, for 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 uh, soil life indeed, but also for uh, for outdoor vegetable growing, especially under uh, the heat of the sun. And also, um, we looked uh, for two years now how the NTO emissions uh, develop, and uh, we could show that. Uh, as compared with bare soil, there were no uh, enhanced emissions. So uh, this might be a strategy for some dry areas where you don't really need additional water, just um, water at the beginning of, of, uh, the uh, of the transplanting, and then the plant should survive. And you see um, how the organic cabbage uh, develop um, in a in a in a in in the setup where we looked at the influence of different of three different mulch materials and measured uh, the greenhouse gases with the Picaro CRDS uh, device, which is on the back of the trailer uh, underneath. And um, producing vegetable is even more important if we look. <clears throat> how a planetary health diet should look like. And if we look at the different um, regions within Hessen, Hessen, it's the, the state, and then we have three different uh, provinces, you can say, or Regierungsbezirk in, uh, in German, Gießen, Kassel, and Hessen. So uh, Kassel has uh, 38 um, percent or 39 percent of self-sufficiency with uh, vegetables, uh, Darmstadt a little bit more, but Gießen less than two percent. So here it's even more important to come up with strategies to uh, really grow healthy vegetables um, uh, at a low carbon or environmental footprint. Closing the yield and efficiency gaps according to best ecologic and agronomic practice. Um, this is also what you're doing out there uh, with natural systems agriculture to make a better use of the soil's potential um, for eco-functional intensification and to somehow close the efficiency and the yield gap. So it's indeed a nice um, concept and it was uh, brought about um, by Meine van Nordwijk and Leibert Prussert a few years ago. And, um, and you can study uh, these um, phenomena also on <clears throat> commercial farms. And we did it a few years ago in, on uh, 20 conventional, 20 conventional no-till and 20 organic uh, farms um, during on-farm research and could show that um, the agricultural intensity index was highest in conventional followed by until and organic. And this responded also to um, on the right side <clears throat> to the um, degree of uh, abuscular mycorrhiza fungi colonization. So the more intensive the system uh, is, um, the, the lower uh, is the, the colonization with, um, with um, mycorrhiza fungi. And as these uh, fungi were closed uh, or in, in, in uh, collaboration with the, the weed rhizosphere, um, the, the weed should profit from such um, um, uh, some bio, uh, symbiosis. And also in a, in a two-year or three-year ongoing field trial, 
at, at two farms. Uh, uh, one was in uh, Oberfeld, which is um, south of Hessen, with sandy soil, and Klapperer Hof has uh, uh, silty clay soil. We sh looked at the um, uh, biological nitrogen fixation in percent of total uh, ni nitrogen um, uptake of the, of six uh, different brain legumes and could show that the sandy soil actually um, is more depending uh, or that, that, that the crops in the sandy soils are far more stronger depending on biologically uh, fixed nitrogen, whereas um, those growing at Klapparer Hof um, can make better use of um, soil nitrogen. And um, this is also important when you um, um, uh, make up your crop rotation or make decisions for planting that you take actually um, the, the pedoclimatic situation into consideration and go for best use of nitrogen. Yes, and finally, um, the potential of integrated animal plant uh, systems and um, development, and, and another word for it is development agriculture and food within planetary boundaries. And now I want to come to, um, to cattle and cows. And you may know this, um, this guy or this uh, famous uh, book and Actually, it um, it influenced me. I uh, studied um, sustainable agriculture in in Aberdeen in Scotland in 1995 when I found uh, when I found it there in the library, and uh, was shocked what was going on uh, with the cattle in um, in different stables um, in the world or. Um, or pens, or how you call it, how you ever call it. So um, actually, we made um, the cow uh, to a pig or to a sow, uh, like we call it in Germany, um, and make uh, to make use of grain instead of uh, roughage. And um, and you can also look from the uh, climate uh, perspective and um, the former. The chair of the IPCC, Rajendra Pachauri, said, please eat less meat. Meat is a very carbon-intensive commodity. And um, in, in Germany and in many other parts of the industrial world, we have um, separated spatially and temporally the animals from drop production, um, Arable land and grassland are not are often not part of the same farm, and and um, and this has led to a lot of environmental problems, which you can see here nicely on the map of Germany. In the northwest of Germany, it's um, west of Hanover, um, south of Bremen. It's um, these are the um, Counties of Emsland, Kloppenburg, Fechter, Borken. Uh, there we have um, most of the livestock, very high livestock densities, and um, and and there uh, feed is still imported from uh, yeah, from Brazil or other um, areas of the world, and um, then we have a surplus of nitrogen, and. Um, there is a, it is necessary to um, reduce the livestock numbers, especially in those regions and in East Germany and in many other parts, um, we, have, um, we have really low livestock density. So East Germany has uh, less than 0.5 livestock units per hectare and their um, organic nutrients or um, yeah, uh, the, the residues from livestock would be even needed for soil improvement. And um, we could show it nicely in our long-term long -term field trial, which is um, coordinated by my colleague Franz Schulz, which you see here from 1998 until, 
until uh, 2014, um, there was a, an increase in soil carbon um, in, in, in soil organic matter in the topsoil. Um, only in the mixed farm, this is the these are the, the black lines, whereas the two livestock free um, systems, green with clover grass and, and uh, orange, livestock free, but only cash crops um, loses soil carbon over time. And um, there is actually a great nutrient potential through uh, forage legumes on, and other legumes which are associated with livestock farming and farm yard manure. And you can see these figures from Catherine Batchley, a few year, uh, quite a, um, quite some years old, but it shows at least um, the potential. And um, my colleague, uh, Professor Friedhelm Tauber from University of Kiel, developed a grassland-based farming system and um, <clears throat> compared it with other um, um, data from, from literature that um, the pasture-based system is um, a a hundred percent pasture-based system can be as efficient in terms of the carbon footprint than intensive uh, dairy um, farming system like confinement or mixed. And um, we got the grant uh, one year ago for the so-called integrated crop um, livestock um, uh, green dairy project, where we compare high input organic um, dairy production with low input dairy production. We divided our Holstein herd into 62 um, high input cows, which get uh, maize to achieve 9,000 liters of milk. And um, the other 62 doesn't get maize and are uh, fed in a manner so that they achieve around 7,000. So this um, um, pairwise uh, system comparison is going on now for um, for one year and um, I cannot show um, data, uh, much data because the transition time from the same genotype uh, to these diff two different feeding regimes also took a while. And now we look at the different impacts at the animal side, at the plant side, because we also have two different slurry tanks, two different milk tanks. Um, and so also the, the, the um, field trial in the, in the, yeah, um, the, the, the uh, green dairy um, plant experiment is also under a specific crop rotation for high input or low input. So to somehow mimic that less uh, food is fed to low input cows. Yeah, and uh, with Green Dairy, we also um, established now um, a living lab called Organic Dairy Germany, where we are part of um, a European uh, funded project called Clean Farms, where Klapperhof serves as a demonstration farm and 10 um, lead commercial farms from the organic uh, dairy network Uplander um, do five of them are also high input and other fives are low input so that we somehow replicate in a living lab construction also the, the trial of green dairy and somehow um, inform all other uh, organic dairy producers around what's going on in terms of greenhouse gas mitigation, inorganic milk, milk production. And um, just a few years, uh, sorry, just a few weeks ago, um, we started um, with another green livestock project. It's called Green Chicken, where we look at the, um, at, at the impact of two feeding regimes to organic outdoor chicken, eggs or broiler, when they get insects or the normal organic grains and to uh, develop a kind of a circular feeding strategy, uh, which is upcycled through uh, Hemetia, Illucens, 
um, larvae uh, which produce a an, an protein feed of about 40% uh, of protein. And this is um, just started. We have uh, just aligned the, the outdoor chicken ranges where we also measure um, greenhouse gases and also look how much is taken up of nitrogen in the upcoming crop when the chicken have left the area so uh, that also when the chickens are on another pasture or another alfalfa field that we can make use of the nitrogen from the chicken for, for growing uh, cereals or other crops for humans and this is um, not established but only the experimental design we are waiting for the two big chicken trailers for 12 treatments so i'm coming to the end and i'm i uh, hope i could um, somehow get you on the way to um, complex food and farming systems which are um, sustainable and so socially just and um, with um, allow um, much less greenhouse gas emissions in 2050. And this was the uh, hypothesis of a former project where I was part of the Willem experiment, but it's still it's still um, existing, and it means um, circularity uh, using. Uh, using plants not just for one purpose, but also more and more for other services and um, come up with more uh, multifunctional agricultural landscapes. We also harvested the first apple last year and uh, we have now a, a cow in our herd, Inge, um, which is um, more than 12 years old and is really, really productive. And I saw her just an hour ago. And um, this means that um, either meat or or just vegan, it's fine. But um, it can be also um, uh, um, a, a meat, um, carrot, leek, potato soup, as you see it here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Andreas. Herzlichen Dank. Um, you have inspired us. Um, you have impressed us with the scope of your research. Some of the things that we just dream about doing, you are doing. So um, I look forward to further conversations and more inspiration and interaction. But now I think we'll have the lights up there, Todd, if you don't mind just putting them up. And we'll give the audience a chance to ask you some questions or make some comments. Okay. You, you mentioned the term biodynamic. What is that mean, I guess? Okay, the question was, what is, what is the definition of biodynamic? The um, biodynamic um, farming system in the, in the dog trial the dog trial means biodynamic, bioorganic, and conventional farming under the same crop rotation. It's a seven-year uh, crop rotation uh, and going on since uh, 1977. Their biodynamic means using the, um, the, the, the two horn preparations. Um, um, one is with the manure uh, horn and uh, plus horn, and the one is um, silica plus horn and the six compost preparation um, in addition, and um, trying to um, do the field activities according to the lunar constellations. There is a, a, a moon calendar um, published every year which uh, recommends doing this or that. So um, this is what um, the, uh, the, the field operation team tries to do to somehow reflect the activities uh, according to the um, Demeter uh, guidelines. And um, yes, and this is, I mean, um, you can believe on it or, or not. And I'm also, um, 
I would say I, I try to be um, objective. And um, this is how um, worldwide around 100,000 100, farmers uh, produce. If you believe on that or not, it's, it's a different issue, but this is how it is done in the doc trial. Okay, thank you very much. Other questions or comments? I mean, we're here at a station that has confined animals. You've seen them here. Um, what are your thoughts? Could we use those animals to do multiple purposes like uh, Andreas is showing us? Um, um, I'm just wondering, can the integration of animals prior to some cereal crops help reduce weed pressure? Okay, uh, the question was, how does the integration of animals reduce weed problems in organic agriculture or maybe in all agriculture? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we are, we are um, here at, um, there, there, are, there are different strategies in organic um, livestock husbandry in, in, in Germany. Uh, what we do here in, in, in many parts of Germany is to, um, to use um, alfalfa, two years of alfalfa in the normal crop rotation. And, uh, and this alfalfa is e either um, given as fresh material into the stable and, and uh, the grassland is just for moving around. Yeah? The grassland is in, in, in early spring, it's a, it's a fodder basis, but then when it becomes dry and drier, it is not, we don't have enough rain to have a hundred percent grassland, a permanent grassland based um, feeding regime. So the alfalfa contributes to it and alfalfa is cut in average four years, uh, four times a year. And with, the, uh, with cutting, um, alfalfa grass, you actually um, disturb uh, thistles or other unwanted plants. Plants you um, improve the competitiveness of alfalfa when you do regularly cutting. So this is really um, a good strategy to get rid of um, the um, um, some some arable um, plant uh, weeds. Um, just through cutting, and this is in indirectly done by by uh, through livestock farming. Yeah, thank you very much. And if you look at the handout, the white handout, you could get a copy there. There's evidence of our research that has shown the same things in Manitoba. I'm going to ask you a question while others think about it. Um, we have an organic farm in Ontario, and I'll get you to write this down. 3Gen Organics, okay? You just put it into a search engine, 3Gen. And they um, have, uh, it's a fascinating farm because they purpose-built uh, the new barns for organic standards. And the sows get a high proportion of alfalfa and other green plant material um, because of course, pigs are omnivores. Uh, what are your thoughts on or the experiences in Germany on feeding uh, pigs with things like alfalfa or or other cover crops? Yes, yes, yeah. This um, it's it's nice to hear that that uh, other far, other farmers on the globe or even in Canada are practicing it in in the German speaking countries, Austria, Switzerland, and, and Germany. I do have heard. Um, uh, from such initiatives and there are different strategies um, one is uh, the the silage yeah so um, uh, producing alfalfa or, or grass clover silage and um, apply it then um, at a at a, a point in the year to um, to, to to the pigs and um, so it i mean in a, in a good silage you can end up with 20% of group protein um, uh, so it really uh, substitutes um, hardly. Uh, it it really substitutes costly um, proteins from faba bean or soya. Uh, so this is a good strategy, and even more promising is to to do kind of <clears throat> stripping uh, to um, 
remove the um, the tiny protein rich leaves from alfalfa or clover by a, a certain um, um, device um, which is so far only from France um, we had a, a, a test uh, a, a pilot on it and then you end up with uh, more than 30% in the in the harvested leaves so if you can really somehow make it that you only um, that you can separate uh, such things then uh, you can also apply it to um, to to the piglets or to to uh, pigs in in the in the really fattening phase Okay, thank you very much. A um, couple of more questions or comments. Yes, Leticia. Have we had any experience on integrating rabbits into organic farming, or how can that be done? It was something like you get to ask your rabbit question. <laughs> awesome, Leticia is is a rabbit expert, so I don't know if you right. heard, you heard the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, there are there are a few um, organic farmers with with rabbits. Um, it is it is not that widespread in in Germany. It's even uh, in in France an issue, and um, I don't know really the uh, the size of the farms, how many how many uh, animals they have, and, and and how how it is arranged. I I cannot answer it. I mean uh, there are small uh, smallholder farmers which have 10 10 or 20 maybe 20 rabbits in a, in a kind of a cage system with a summer outdoor uh, range but i would not say that it is somehow commercial okay thank you yeah. rob um, i stepping out of my area here but I'm wondering in uh, organic versus conventional farming, whether there's any differences in nitrogen oxide release, particularly under water logging. So, water logging. So, did you hear the question, Andreas? Could you please repeat, um, yeah. Martin? So, yeah, is there any difference in nitrous oxide emissions in organic versus conventional agriculture, especially under water logging conditions? Yeah. Yeah, this is a this is a good question. Um under water logging conditions, um or or say the other way, when we when we do everything the same, but uh apart from uh, from different um uh, management history, but if we do right now everything the same. Uh, which means water logging and and nitrogen uh, fertilization intensity organic farming produces more nitrous oxide and this is mainly due to um, higher microbial activity um, and more soil organic matter um, in the soil which is um, uh, favorable which favors um, denitrification once the soil reaches um, uh, uh, soil water porosity or water uh, water filled pore space more than um, 70%. So um, the question is yes, but what do we see when we go to the field um, in, in, um, in conventional farming, the average uh, nitrogen fertilization intensity in Germany is around 200 hectare and in organic we talk about 70 or 80, so um, we don't have enough uh, substrate for um, for nitrification and also for denitrification. So in the end, um, across um, all the years, um, you might have situations where the emission pattern are the same, but but through a whole year, because this is important when you want to do climate balancing, you have to look at least um, the whole um, cropping pr uh, period from uh, crown bed preparation, um, fertilization, seed seeding, and so on. Um, it is less what is coming out from organic. Okay, thank you. Well, um, 
we have another, maybe our last question, unless somebody has a burning one after that, but please go ahead. So um, this is not my uh, area of expertise at all, um, but some numbers that I heard at some point when we were very chunky was that cows, when you compare all the mammals in the world by weight, cows are 60% of weight, right? So definitely we need to reduce that bad amount of cows. Um, so what is the level of reduction needed to be consistent with uh, reducing the emission to an animal by, you know, that we need in like whatever system that you put it, right? That, that is like a hundred forestry or whatever system we can imagine. Okay, so, what is the level of reduction? so that that is a global question asking what should be the reduction in the number of cows globally. I don't know if uh, if you want to tackle that question, but I'll give you the opportunity. Yep, there is a nice um, study a few years ago, uh, ago um, 2015, from uh, Christian Schader, a former colleague from Feeble and others, which look um, if we somehow um, um, uh, uh, look at uh, global livestock from the sufficiency perspective, it means using um, <clears throat> permanent grassland, which is globally two-thirds of total agricultural land, and and adapt to the to the land resources our livestock instead of the other way around. And, uh, and this would mean that um, the, the cattle um, numbers would slightly increase, but at the expense of a reduction um, for uh, monogastrics, uh, for pigs and, and poultry. So, um, and, and doing this, we could um, reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions. We would have enough uh, calories for um, 10 billion people. So uh, this is quite a, 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 a nice modeling exercise, if it is really true at the end, but um, it is a highly cited paper and shows, yes, uh, we have potential of um, aligning um, the, the global livestock types and numbers and align them with the resources, better align them with the resources we have. Thank you for that wonderful answer. Maybe not the answer you were expecting, but a more inspiring answer. So to tailor the livestock system to the landscape. So useful. Um, okay, we are at the top of the hour and I have one last, I'm gonna ask the last question and we didn't prepare this ahead of time, but what is, and what is your advice for a Canadian university that has a 120 year, agricultural history, um, when we're considering that we need to do our agriculture different in the future? What are you, one or two thoughts about what we should do with the curriculum? Should we have more experiential learning? Should we shift this whole farm to organic so that we really challenge ourselves? Do you have any final words of wisdom for us? <laughs> yeah, this is a nice question. I cannot give you um, um, in, in, in a smart answer right away. I would rather come up with with some thoughts which might be worth to look at. Actually, um, um, the recommendation for for the university and for the for the students is to be uh, uh, to, to 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 be really. Was heißt mutig? Nochmal mutig, mut haben. Yeah, mutig, motivated, uh, enthusiastic, Mot enthusiastic. Yeah. Exactly, enthusiastic, and also um, to to really go for for new ways. And um, uh, the examples what um, what I showed you, what we're doing here on our research platform, Club Baro, this um, wasn't wasn't done uh, before I came, so I could really um, motivate other researchers, other conventional agriculture professors to um, to look what is the potential if we somehow align our whole livestock um, system to organic because there we have a transparent uh, animal welfare system yeah 
is the highest standard um, you can you can get commercially and 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 look if if this isn't feasible we we can stop with livestock farming because on so far only the um, organic standards uh, can be ex explained to to consumers and even the consumers um, are sometimes wondering uh, why we do not um, allow the the calves for um, staying with the mothers for six months? So um, to do, uh, I would say, uh, to start with with a lighthouse project and and try to get as many other agronomists and and social scientists and and um, environmentalists on on board and do it with, with the students. And then you're really proud that uh, the students identify um, themselves with, with that, what is ongoing on, on the farmland of the university. Okay, that's wonderful. That's great inspirational advice. Would you like to say thank you in Spanish to our Chilean friend? Sure, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that's great. Um, Andreas, herzlichen Dank war uh, uh, ausgezeichnet. And um, let's give him a hand and thank him for taking uh, For those of you who are watching online, uh, and for those of you, this is recorded, you will be sent the Zoom link so that you can watch this and maybe see some of the papers. So thank you very much for staying up till nine o'clock at night. Uh, or whatever it is now, uh, 2100. Um, uh, again, thank you very much. And uh, we will talk again. And I wish you and your colleague a uh, wonderful evening. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. And have a nice um, um, follow-up of the, of the farm tour. Okay. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers.